Welcome back, everybody, to the Denver Broncos franchise on Madden 20. Today, we are going to recap the offseason that I was finally able to stream this past weekend as we prepare for a ninth year in the series. We have won three consecutive Super Bowl titles, but I still really enjoy playing this series and I want to keep making content in it with a franchise that is still interesting. And I felt for that to be the case, I had to make some changes that would add realism and challenge to the series. I spent time going through players that I felt did not get enough development when we had lower XP sliders and a lot of players on CPU teams now have much better ratings that reflect their awards and production in the league. I've also gone through contracts on our team to make them much more realistic. Part of why they've been lower is because some of these contracts were signed when players were lower rated, but I have fixed those deals. Boogie Turner has a deal that rivals Aaron Donald's currently with the Rams. I fixed a lot of deals for players like Xavier Watts, Eric Palmer, Eric McKinney. A lot of those deals are much more realistic, and that's going to make the salary cap challenge a major thing for this series going forward, especially now with Boogie Turner's mega deal kicking in. Same for the Eric Palmer contract, and now we're setting aside money for future deals to players perhaps like Jamari Akinjide, Levi Summers, Vashawn Wright. So I knew this was going to be a really interesting offseason simply because of the salary cap. For retirement, many big name players from the beginning of the series have now retired as more and more of the league is basically players that were drafted in this series. We had one retirement, as expected, Zach Martin. We signed him for one year last season to give us a boost along the offensive line, and that certainly worked. But now there is a hole at right guard we have to take care of, and we see the Chargers have a new head coach, although they're running the same exact schemes. Well, maybe the schemes are different, but the playbooks are the same, so I don't expect much change. For regression, it really wasn't too bad for a lot of these players. Bradley Chubb's deal is up. He's down 12 points. Miles Jack down 12 points. He's 31 years old. Mac Hillhouse is down 8. Damian Charles just 1. Lindsey Muldrow 2. And Darnell Savage, also a free agent now. He is down 10. Overall, regression wasn't too bad, but now... The tough decisions about who to re-sign and who to let test free agency. We had around, I think, 30, 40 million dollars of cap space. And that basically meant we were guaranteed to lose a lot of players. Tyrone Houston was one player to really think about because he's 25 with superstar development and really good ratings. But he wanted over 10 million dollars a season and in the snaps we've given him I don't think he's been a superstar caliber receiver yet. We haven't seen a lot of big plays So do you sign him just trusting the ratings or do we let him test free agency? Keeping in mind that Vashawn Wright's deal is up next year same with Levi Summers and other players so as always, I just went to the lower rated players that I felt were important to keeping on the roster. Courtney Hayward is one of my favorite backups on the team. He's 25 with star development. We signed him to a two year, $5 million contract. But for many of these players, I decided to let them test knowing that we didn't have much cap space and I'd have to replace a lot of these depth players in the draft. With less cap space this year, even those five million a year deals or four, were ones I weren't that interested in. So Cam Smithson, solid pass rusher. He's been a part-time player and a good one, but I think for $5 million a season, we have to look at who we already have and give them some opportunities. Justin Payne, Tommy Jordan, two more players I let test free agency, but not Cameron Britt. I wanted to sign him to a two-year deal. I do like him and his upside. Same with Vaughn Tatum at corner. I like being very deep at that position. Also signed Deontay Walker. I like these backup linebackers a lot. So then eventually I had to get to some of these tougher decisions and I chose to let most of these players test. Bradley Chubb wanting around 14 million dollars a year. That's not going to work anymore and we have some edge rushers. We have to see something from this coming season. 
And for Tyrone Houston, I just felt like for 10 million plus a year, when we have other deals to worry about, and we haven't really seen the play we expect from that contract yet, I chose to let him test free agency, but was still interested in possibly bringing him back. So now let's advance past this stage. We had $38 million in cap space, and I already knew I wanted to trade Terrell Corville. I talked about that in some of the other streams I've done. I don't see him as a big scheme fit for how we play. And ever since we played the Rams, I realized that Dallas Levine is the exact player that I think our offense needs. His skill set would be perfect for what I want to do. So let's check out free agency now, and a lot of the players from our team are the best available. Darnell Savage, Bradley Chubb, two of the top three free agents getting a lot of interest around the league. The top offensive lineman I felt like would be a fit for us was Andrew Talley, but he had a lot of interest, and 13 teams were very interested in Tyrone Houston. So right off the bat, you can already tell there's going to be some change for our team and around the league. For the offensive line, missing Zach Martin, I knew that was going to be a priority. And with us being a rushing offense now, I really had to make sure the offensive line was ready to go for this coming season. Defensively, I wanted to see what we could get from Trey Walker and Jazeer Deacon, but thought about still adding another edge rusher. And then safety was also a priority. But knowing I was trading Terrell Corville at some point, and I feel like if it were in the game, he would want to be traded. He didn't even get to 900 yards last year. He wasn't the main receiver even in the offense, and it was a rushing offense. So there's no reason he'd want to stay in Denver if he can get a better role somewhere else for his late 20s. So I took a long look at the receivers, and I felt like there were a lot of options for various roles, but none that fit perfectly. None like Dallas Levine. And then I wondered, could we find a trade that worked for Dallas Levine? He is the receiver that I want in this offense. I would trade Terrell Corville and more to acquire him. And we talked a lot in the stream about if this would even be realistic, if the Rams would entertain this. When I make a trade in this series, I try to make it a deal that makes sense and I don't try to just take advantage of what the game allows you to do just because sometimes trades work and they don't make sense. So I thought about making an offer they couldn't refuse and took a look at some key ratings. He is one of the best short route runners in the league. He has great run after the catch skills. I felt like Nathan Butler was another interesting receiver for New Orleans who was on the trade block. Ultimately I went back to free agency. And I didn't want to give a five-year offer to Andrew Talley. Just with the way our salary is set up right now, it wouldn't fit great. So I gave him a big one-year offer. I knew that wouldn't be a problem. So that ended up working. $15 million for one season, replacing Zach Martin. We don't have to think about guard now. I still thought tackle is something we could think about, but at least this offensive line is very similar to last year's. And we see... In the first round of free agency, Darnell Savage, we'll see him again soon. He's going to Kansas City, Bradley Chubb going to the Ravens, Herb Smith going to New Orleans, Tyrone Houston, four-year deal from Cleveland. He's helping replace Odell Beckham Jr., who retired. Benny Huggins from Kansas City is going to the Bears. Prescott Pemberton, the new quarterback in New York. And Jason Murray now staying in division, going to the Dallas Cowboys. Darnell Livingston gets a nice deal from San Francisco. Cam Smithson's going to the Chiefs. Cliff Bell Johnson to the Raiders. So much movement. And we're going to see these players now. So many of these opponents are going to be on our schedule. Justin Payne as well to the Raiders. When it came to the receiver position, I wanted to see combine grades before I made any decisions as far as trading Corville or targeting free agents. And there were a lot of intriguing receivers, none that were like elite caliber prospects, but I was looking for good 40 times, at least like a 4-5 or so, good 3 cone, good shuttle, trying to find somebody who can give us some yards after the catch. We missed that a year ago, and I think that we need that skill set in the offense. 
Stephen Kemp was definitely interesting with his great speed and his route running skills. Keep in mind, I did know a lot of these top threes, even if it doesn't show them as scouted. I did the draft show and I saved that info, but obviously didn't have them directly here in game. Jamil Garland getting interest. I did think about bringing him back. We at least know him. He's experienced, but the Raiders had interest. Tommy Jordan has safety experience, but a lot of teams liked him. Also, he's not a great run support safety, and that was the role I was looking for with Xavier Watts taking over Darnell Savage's old role. Let's go to running back here. There were some that caught my attention, and RJ Bailey is somebody that I liked because... He's really well-rounded. He can catch the football, run between the tackles. I felt like he'd be a versatile backup. I gave some other low offers that had very low chances of succeeding. Just trying to get some more signings. So we go past this stage and we do add RJ Bailey, making running back even deeper. I felt like he could take over Danny Heath's role and be a lot more versatile, whereas I thought Heath was just only a receiving back. Bailey can get goal line carries and do a lot more. Next up, we had a fifth year option to think about, and it was a player that I have intended to re-sign. This would delay it a season, but the fifth year option was up for JT Granger III, and I've loved how he's played the last two years. He was especially good a year ago. So we pick that up, meaning in 2028, his salary goes all the way up to $13.7 million. All right, I got to see some combine grades, thought a lot about receiver, and that was the primary topic for much of the offseason. And could I perhaps acquire Dallas Levine? I felt like if I were to make a trade that was fair for them, I'd have to solve one of their biggest problems and maybe trade them somebody like Damian Charles who could start, maybe even Mac Hillhouse. I decided to save and just test something out with the trading here and how much interest they'd have in some of these players. And it turned out that they did not really have interest in trading Dallas Levine, even for Terrell Corville to replace him. Damian Charles and Mac Hillhouse. I couldn't believe it. I was sure that would go through. A first round pick, they don't value that at all compared to Dallas Levine. It doesn't matter what package I put together. Like literally, any package was going to fail. They didn't even want Boogie Turner for Dallas Levine. So that wasn't going to happen. We had to look for another team and there were a couple fits. I wanted to trade him to the NFC primarily and I felt like a team that would have a lot of interest is the New York Giants who just added Prescott Pemberton the third and could use some more receivers. Now this was a part of the offseason where a lot of people didn't like that I was thinking about trading a lot of picks together with the Giants to move up. But I felt like this was a realistic trade. And honestly, the value between pick 10 and 32 is massive. The caliber of player you can draft at 10 is so different than 32. Don't look at it like first round pick for first round pick. There's so much value in those 22 spots of difference that they're falling down. So how do you make it worth it for a team to drop from 10 to 32? I felt like Corville and a third round pick would be fair for both teams and now gets us a chance to consider prospects we certainly weren't at 32 overall. There were some elite prospects in this class that I liked a lot. And with us losing a lot of these veterans, replacing one with an impact player would be nice. But I also wanted to find some values here. I didn't do a good job of scouting late round picks and I wanted to give us some options because some of these players might need to play or contribute somehow, or they're going to be the direct backup to somebody and you never know what happens with injuries. Last thing I did is take a look at teams that could be interested in quarterback, and there were a few teams that I thought could target quarterback in this draft, and there were a couple great ones at the top of the class. But nobody towards the top of the draft actually needed quarterback. So what would the LA Chargers do? I felt like they might go with Lester Thorne here, solidify the offensive line for Oliver Raymond, but they go with Kalispell pass rusher, the 20-year-old Montrell Griffin. I know that we don't know his full story yet on the channel. You will find out more about him in the Kalispell mega episode I have coming up and how he became a number one caliber prospect. 
That's a big addition for this Chargers defense. Lester Thorne ends up going number two to the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Vikings at three go Trajan Baskerville. I knew he would go early. I knew this was possible. He replaces Irv Smith, and he's another option now for Brandon Warren as the Vikings try to turn this around. First receiver off the board, Cornell McAllister to New England. Next up, Marquavion Hairston going to Washington. And how about this tandem now? They already had Jarrett Maxiel, one of the up-and-coming stars in the league. And they just added another difference maker at edge rusher. KJ Holiday, I knew was a can't-miss prospect. With his top three, his combine, I knew he would be interesting for us. And there were some pass rushers I was considering as well. I knew there would be great options for us at 10. Potentially some early first round talents. But I felt like maybe moving up was essential here. KJ Holiday was my main target. But how much do you give up? A second round pick to jump up four spots. That's pretty common here early in the draft. But it would take even more. And I really didn't want to do that. Knowing that I could use those top 100 picks to draft some replacements. Green Bay was after Detroit. Corner already solid on their roster. So I felt like they wouldn't take KJ Holiday, but they did. There is the deepest cornerback group perhaps in the league right up there with us. So I had to call an audible after that. Tyson Scott goes to the Jets and the Bucks go Timmy Redding from Clemson. That put us on the clock for the first time, still with early first round talents available. Jordan Rush could replace Bradley Chubb and help compete with Jazeer Deacon and Tyson Walker. There was also Ashton Bully from Colorado at guard. I felt like those were the only two options because early first round talent you can't pass on. And I took Ashton Bully because I felt like with us being this rushing team, I want to solidify the offensive line for the future. I thought I was drafting an elite guard, but looking at his ratings and his athleticism, I want to see Bully play tackle. He has elite strength. He's a great athlete. I don't think he has to just stay at guard. I want to try him at tackle this year and see how that works out. Only normal development, but a great offensive lineman nonetheless. Following our pick, the run on pass rushers began. And we saw four consecutive defensive ends and edge rushers be taken, including Kirkland Lincoln to the Chiefs at 73 overall. Next up at 15, the Cowboys go Rashawn Mashaka, 78 overall receiver. That is also somebody we could have considered. Only one overall less than Bully. Malcolm Schmidt goes to the Bengals, second tight end in the first round. Denard McDaniels from Boston College. And then Kevin Hampton from Kalispell, center going to the LA Rams. The Raiders go with Tony Bonds, a cornerback I liked a lot. That's a solid pick for them. Lyle Graves goes to Philadelphia. And Carolina goes with Quandre Young. A lot of these front seven players going off the board quickly. And then the first quarterback to the Buffalo Bills. It is Chidi Ikachukwu, and we will see him late in the season. He'll get a chance to develop for a while, and then we'll see him week 16. I was curious if more quarterbacks would go in this range. Jacksonville was a team I thought should go quarterback early. There was still Cameron Grimes, and they go with Lindsey Knighton instead. Miami, at pick 27, they ended up taking Gerard Gaddison from Penn State, who is the player I planned on selecting with our next pick, but he was drafted over 10 spots ahead of us. Towards the end of the first round, Dion Jeffrey off the board. He's somebody I thought we could draft if we stayed at 32, but we would have had to move up. And Jeremiah McLeod goes to Cleveland. We talked earlier about the Giants dropping from 10 to 32, receiver also being in need. They could have stayed at 10 and drafted Roshan Mashaka. Instead, they end up with Terrell Corville, Willie Jenkins, and a third round pick. So now the Giants trying to get a lot deeper at receiver with their new quarterback. We see Dom Hampton go off the board, the first running back. The second round seems to begin the run on running backs, third round is quarterbacks. And I think he'll be starting for the Chargers before season's end. 
Apollo Burgess going to Minnesota. They have a good tandem now with him and Terrence Rivers. Montel Jenkins off the board. I had interest in him. Coco Lemon. The running backs continue to go. Vic Cooper going to Detroit. They did not need him, by the way. They signed two running backs in free agency. And then we're on the clock now here in the second round. And this is where I was thinking about receiver possibly with safety I feel like there was one option Tyrell Bynes but the receivers I thought were better in this range and I wanted to draft one here the Myron Spellman was interesting the 45840 worried me a little bit I also like Jericho Knight I felt like we had some good edge rushers to potentially play so receiver ended up being the pick here and I decided to go with Steven Kemp and I finally add a wide receiver with that great route running top three on top of that he has great speed acceleration at 98 the only thing is that release catching catching traffic those are low to start out and he doesn't have those secondary skills with the elusiveness and juke and spin but I still think that he's somebody that can create a big role in the offense we picked again here in the second round at 64 overall, and I knew I'd have to add another receiver at some point. Before, with the previous pick, I was choosing between Spellman and Kemp. I could just take Spellman now, but I saw these other receivers and knew that the depth was still there. I didn't have to address receiver right here. So I drafted Jericho Knight, one of the only edge rushers I still had interest in, giving us a lot of competition for the preseason at edge rusher. Jazeer Deacon, Jericho Knight, Trey Walker, can't wait to see how that plays out. And then Cameron Grimes going to the Chargers. I really wanted to see him go somewhere where he could start, but this has happened a lot in the series. And then Lomiron Spellman ends up going to Tennessee a few picks later. And Antoine Morgan, Kalispell quarterback, going to New Orleans. Jarrell Stoudemire off the board. Good value pick for the Cowboys. So in the fourth round here, I felt like Danny Reed Gray was an interesting prospect. And we get our first hidden development player of the day, 68 overall with zone coverage archetype. Now his speed is a little bit lower. I wonder if he's going to be more of a slot corner, but he has press ability. So with 89 speed and good press, that may be enough. Markel Ingram going to Baltimore, another Kalispell player drafted. And with our second fourth round pick, this is again where I thought about wide receiver. Sid Rollins, LJ Molina, those were the two I was considering. And I chose LJ Molina because he gave us some size and a more possession receiver skill set I thought we could use. He's only 21 years old and he's a pretty good route runner. I think you can go in any direction with his skill set because everything is so solid. So we'll start developing him and finding a role soon. Sid Rollins ended up going to Philadelphia a couple picks later. In the fifth round, I wanted to finally address safety with a really good athlete. Avery Bierschbach, hidden development from Kennesaw State. So no hidden development early, but now a couple interesting developmental players later on that we can think about for the future. In the sixth round, we saw the Dolphins continue to draft well. They always seem to take high overall players even late into the draft. They also ended up with four hidden dev players in this class. In the sixth round, I saw the bench press here for Terrence Stanton and wanted to add some depth and we get a very good player. 74th best player in the class by overall rating and I think he's a potential starter with these skills You don't normally find offensive linemen this good late in the draft and then in the seventh round I drafted a quarterback Jaleel Hester who had one of the best 40 times. He also has hidden development He has great size and we'll talk about him in a couple minutes and then mystery relevance I drafted a running back who had an outstanding combine, Sean Monk, 98 speed, 95 acceleration, we'll see what he can do in preseason, that speed is going to be fun. 
Overall, I thought we had a pretty solid draft class. I would have liked to get a couple hidden development players at the top, but we get them later with, I think, some potential day one starters early on with Ashton Bully and Steven Kemp. I expect this class to play a lot this year. But as always, here are players I did not draft, including KJ Holiday. He is an incredible player, although he doesn't really fit my style of play with low press and medium zone coverage on day one, but it'll get there, I'm sure. Here's the one that was tough, because Gerard Gaddison, I really wanted to take him in the second round, and I think he was the perfect receiver for the role that I'm trying to create on this team. He has run after the catch skills, he's a good route runner. The Dolphins, though, had an outstanding draft class. They should have a lot of players contributing from this year. Here's the number one pick, Montreal Griffin. We will see him week one with Joey Bosa on the opposite side. Number two pick, Lester Thorne had hit in development. Really good ratings here for a day one tackle. Number three pick, Trajan Baskerville, 87 speed, 80 catching. He will immediately start in the Vikings offense. And the pass rushers in this class were very intriguing. Here is Nathan Shiragane. I was considering maybe a move up from 32 to try to get him or Jordan Rush. But the pass rushers went early, and I can't wait to see how the Rookie of the Year battles go this year with so many good players. Roshan Mashaka, we could have taken him at 10. Excellent route runner. He does have some run after the catch skills as well. I never really considered him that seriously with that number 10 pick. I did consider Lemiron Spellman later, and he had hidden development. I chose to go with Steven Kemp over him. He's got great route running and some run after the catch skills as well. So, I'm not sure yet if we got the right receivers, but I do like the receivers that we did add. Chidi Ikachukwu will start day one for the Bills, and I can't wait to see how he develops as a rookie. The ratings are definitely week one ready. And I think we have maybe the best schedule we've ever had in this series. We play so many players from our old teams and so many impact rookies. But I want to take you through what I found after the stream. Jalil Hester is moving to tight end because he has a great skill set already to start playing there. Probably making the roster as well. He has already the best speed out of any tight end on our team. He has the second highest catching at 74. I think in the preseason we're going to see him a lot. The only thing that could hold him back right now I think is the route running. So I looked for another quarterback to sign and I found Brendan Clarkson. His arm isn't that strong, but the accuracy is solid. He has some mobility as well. I think he's a solid backup going forward and maybe one day even a starter. At running back, I didn't make any moves. Can you believe that? I think we have enough running backs, and I drafted one with the last pick anyway. At receiver, I've been trying to find that run after the catch receiver. Well, undrafted rookie Rashawn Carroll is going to get some chances. He's a 61 overall. He is very raw as a receiver, but he's got excellent speed. He's got moves. He's a kick returner. I think the special team skills can at least have him make the roster, but I want to find out if there's perhaps a chance to use him on offense this season. I also signed Emeka Clements. He has a skill set we don't really have much of at defensive end. He's more of a base end that can set the edge and play the run. I also signed LSU corner Gerald Poole. He's got elite speed and solid press ability on day one, and he can tackle. He could have a starting future. I also signed a veteran safety Tyrone Carroll. And this is going to be one of those spots we have competition in the preseason. Carroll is a veteran, a former third round pick. He's played a fair amount of snaps in his career. But now he's going to have a chance to become a starter if he wins the preseason competition. And he'll be playing the role that Xavier Watts used to have. I think this preseason is going to be so interesting to see who can earn snaps at wide receiver. We are so inexperienced there now. I may have to make a trade, I may not, but we're going to find out a lot about these young receivers. Along the O-line, Bully will move out to tackle, and then defensively. 
Who starts at defensive end opposite Eric Palmer? Who starts at strong safety? Those are the main questions we have to answer, and the preseason will begin soon. I do hope to stream some of that and get that video up this week and get us ready for year nine in the Broncos franchise. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the offseason and are ready for another year in the series. I'm hoping that what I've done for this offseason creates a more realistic and interesting year nine, and I can't wait to get into it. Leave your thoughts on the offseason down below. Who would you have drafted with the 10th pick or our first second round pick? Let me know. Please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll be on to the offseason here soon. Have a great day.